Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation and actually the last video in the playlist, what is representation theory? Uh, very sadly, but this is already the last video. I had a lot of fun, uh, but anyway, so I promised in the first video an application um, to chemistry and I would really like to do this because it's so great. It's so cute. So representation theory is not just smooth, beautiful, nice, but it's also super applicable. And it's it's really great how nature mimics uh, mathematics, or maybe mathematics mimics nature, I can't tell, or they're just doing uh, everything at once, I don't know. But it, it's it's really great, and I would like to sketch um, how representation theory is applied in chemistry. And actually, it turns out that I have li some links to some really nice uh, representation theory and chemistry books in the description and they do quite a lot so it's really impressive what they know and what they use so it's, it's really sophisticated tools in representation theory that turn up in um, your chemistry and in some sense the chemists are actually better representation theorists than representation theorists so it, it, it really are really good at computing characters and all of that it's, it's really really very impressive very readable uh, some of them uh, linked in the description but anyway, uh, of course, that's not mandatory. So let's just jump into the video. And the main idea is pretty simple. It took a while to really get started in representation theory. No, sorry, in chemistry. Uh, maybe because representation theory needed some time to get started. But the idea is pretty simple. You have a molecule. And my running example will always be ammonia. Um, because ammonia is nice. Who doesn't like ammonia? Ammonia is great. So we have uh, an N and three H's. Uh, arranged in a triangle around N, and here's, of course, this little triangle. And it turns out that the symmetry group of this molecule um, is the symmetry group D3, so acting on a triangle. And what is D3? Well, it can rotate the triangle, and it can reflect in a, in a, in a line. So D3 is this order six group, um, the uh, symmetry group of the triangle. And in this case, it's a symmetry group of ammonia as well. And what, that's what called, it's called a molecular, molecular symmetry. And physicists like to study and chemists like to study symmetries because they kind of uh, correspond to fixed points and preserving energies and systems and something like this. So think about Noether theorem if you know what Noether theorem is. Um, so symmetry groups should play a huge role or at least some important role in chemistry and they do. And the main way to study symmetry groups, maybe I've convinced you by now, is to use linear uh, representations, so linear characters and groups and characters and linear everything, and kind of try to use them in this case to predict and explain chemical behaviors. And that works. It works really, really well. And I can, of course, only sketch it in this video. It's beautiful. It's great. It's absolutely nice. I will stay my, with my ammonia example, but wait, and which kind of looks very silly, but they are much more complicated molecules. And you, you really need to use sophisticated character theory to study them. In this case, I mean, this is S3. Uh, so D3 happens to be isomorphic to S3. The correct picture here is D3, the, the hydro group, not S3. But this group is certainly well understood. So, uh, but anyway, it's still fun. So let's do it. Right? So symmetries of uh, the, the molecule determine its uh, chemical properties in some sense. A slight catch here. So the chemists by, by nature, basically, by birth of this part of chemistry, usually like to consider certain groups, namely certain symmetry groups of objects. That's, that's what it is. And these are just not all groups. So they don't consider all groups and they have a slightly different notation um, than uh, you would usually see in representation theory. So here's my character table of D3 produced with the usual magma code linked in the description. And that's what I copied from a chemist book. So they named this group differently. It's the same group. And you can see here, it's really the same character table. Yeah, so here you go. It's really the same. Beast, slightly rearranged. So as you can see, they decided to swap those two uh, columns, but it doesn't really matter. So for them, it actually makes sense to not think of them abstractly, obviously. Um, and also for, for us, of course, for everyone, it makes sense not just to think abstractly. Abstractly is very powerful. But here, in this case, there are groups of certain objects. There's so many groups of objects. So you can think of them geometrically. And that's what, what is done here. So the conjugacy clauses are actually the conjugacy clause of the, well, the trivial one, the rotations and the reflections. And as you can see, for example, here's the, the signed representation is different from the trivial representation on the reflection part. And this is a two-dimensional representation, which is really just a rotation representation in two dimensions of the triangle. 
That's so that's what it is. And they have two different characters, which we come back to later, or two different representations, which have those names. And as you can see, they're just a A1 plus a E E. This is this one. So we just add those numbers. Um, you get three zero one, and the other one is this one. So those two together, and they have slightly different characters. And as you can see, they differ on the reflection part. So what I say here is the character table for ammonia is exactly this one here, and chemists really. If you open a chemist book, a theoretical chemistry in, in this part of chemistry, like molecular chemistry, you will see zillions of those tables. It's just it's just really, really impressive. And they've really used it. So let me show you actually two applications uh, for ammonia. So I'm going to stick with ammonia. And one of them is kind of fun. It's kind of a fun fact what ammonia does. So ammonia is not really flat. It's It has this triangle shape, and it's a little bit pointy towards one side. As you can see here in this picture, maybe I go back to the bigger picture. It's a, it's a little bit sticks out to one side, and it can actually do the following, and it's called um, inversion. So a chemical inversion, it can just mirror itself. It's it's a little bit like a um, like an umbrella. So the, the the ammonia looks like an umbrella, and if it's too windy, the umbrella keeps over and inverts itself. Who doesn't know this? Very annoying, but it might happen. Uh, and ammonia does the same. So if you have enough energy, ammonia pops over um, and becomes dual ammonia, whatever you want to call it. It's still ammonia, but it's kind of in, points in the opposite. It really likes the umbrella, and now it's the umbrella that points outwards instead of inwards. Um, and everything, kind of fun fact now, is that all other molecules with the same type of symmetry group, here again, uh, so this is whatever it is, phosphine. So this is a P and this is still ages. They can do the same. They also have this umbrella type shape and they can invert themselves. And turns out that this is predicted by representation theory. Um, it turns namely out that the following, so the, the representations from before, um, they should be related by reflection because they kind of differ exactly on those levels. And it turns out that the eigenvalues you would calculate for, so the energy states you would calculate from those um, representations, appear in real life. So you can both calculate both. So there should be a reflection operation relating them just from plain character theory. And there is. And this is just this inversion of the molecule, which is kind of really, really cool. And like, it works for all molecules with the symmetry. Um, uh, here are just two examples. Uh, you, you certainly need different energy values, so the precise energies depend on the molecule. So N, so ammonia is kind of low, and the phosphine is much higher. So um, as far as I understand, I might be wrong here. Um, so this is kind of what's kind of predicted by representation theory, at least for by, by some version of this representation theory by uh, theoretical chemistry, at least for the more complicated molecules. And then it was reproduced in... Uh, in an experiment, and it took a while to, to will it be reproduced because you need quite high energy levels, but you can. And if you know what to do, it's kind of, it's, it's really kind of cool. So representation theory tells you, okay, um, the two representations that really appear, so you measure the energy values and they appear, they correspond to eigenvalues and eigenvectors of those representations. They should be related by a reflection. That's what the character table does, tells you. So the molecules somehow should be related by, a, there should be some reflection operation on the molecules. And there is. And that's just, that's just a bit, that's really, really nice. It's just so surprising how mass and real world kind of fit together, if you want to call inversion of, uh, of uh, ammonia molecule real world, but think of the umbrella again. So the umbrella is also related by a reflection, the inside umbrella and the outside umbrella, and you need some energy to do it. So usually it's wind or something. Uh, so maybe there's some, uh, I think for umbrella, nobody has worked it out, but there might be some similar uh, reasoning here. The umbrella also has some kind of, it's not really a triangle type shape, but you can imagine that you would have something similar if you have uh, a higher polygon and it's still some, this would be a D6, for example. So the umbrella is kind of, it's not really a circle, it's a, it's a high polygon. So there will be some similar effect maybe. Good research question. Now you can try to uh, do this research question. Forget it, it's just, just the umbrella picture. I like it because it's kind of, uh, it's very nice. And basically what people do in this, um, in this setup is that the molecular symmetry group should be the group that leaves the Hamiltonian invariant. I'm not going to explain what the Hamiltonian is, the kind of standard notion 
uh, the energy function of quantum mechanics, which kind of determines everything. And it's kind of, by kind of some version of invariant theory by Noether theorem, the Mollica symmetry group, the invariant group should encode a lot of information and that's what it does. And I just showed you one example of those. Um, I didn't show you the time symmetries. I only showed you the space symmetries, but okay. Um, and there's also some, some other symmetries involved. But basically, this is basically what it is. I showed you the space symmetries, the other symmetries. And actually, strictly speaking, the molecular symmetry group is always bigger than the one you get by just looking at the symmetries of the molecule in space. There will be time and particles involved and so on. Anyway, the point is there is, and it's kind of a general philosophy in physics and molecular chemistry, um, symmetries of the Hamiltonian should encode chemical properties because it's a Hamiltonian. And uh, linear symmetries, that's representations. So just put that both together and you should get some, some nice theory. So um, that's pretty cool, I think. So here, actually, it turns out that ammonia has a little bit of a bigger symmetry group. It actually has 12 elements. It's not D3, it's D3 cross Z mod 2. And basically what there is, is that there's an additional symmetry coming from some spin change going from a plus state to a minus state. But otherwise, this picture is really just what we have seen before. So all the plus pictures, so let's see. So A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. So here have rotations. And then here is probably a reflection. A stays A, B, C, swap places, and then you have rotations again. So um, the not dashed ones, the, the solid ones here, that's the D3 I showed you. And then there's some other symmetry coming from some spin change and you have everything kind of uh, reversed again. Okay, and um, final application again for ammonia. So now you should be able to use kind of any fancy trick you know from representation theory to determine uh, properties of, uh, uh, kind of to determine the properties of chemical elements and molecules and so on, and maybe uh, predict what's happening. And here's a really cool one, uh, link to the papers in the description. So basically, um, you have this problem here in representation theory yeah, that you have both of these turning up and they are almost the same up to the reflection. But if you restrict to the subgroup of Z mod 3, so when you don't allow the reflection symmetry, uh, these two representations are the same. So prediction would be if you kind of can somehow break the reflection symmetry of ammonia, it should not invert itself anymore. There should be no turning out. It should stop it from breaking out. It should force the umbrella to just point in one direction. And they did that in an experiment. And basically what you need to do or what they did is they put, I don't know the chemical details, but basically they put ammonia in, um, in a magnetic field and the magnetic field prevents ammonia from having the reflection symmetry. And it turns out that if you put ammonia in, an, in this magnetic field, then it doesn't have the inversion property anymore uh, because now it just has Z mod three as a group and both these appearing energy states are actually now the same and there's no reflection that it relates them. And this is really, this is really, really good. Cool. I said again, so basically what we did here was to use Frobenius reciprocity, so we restrict a representation to a subgroup that's kind of breaking a symmetry of a, of a, a molecule and some representations will collapse. So some chemical properties won't happen anymore. And here's an example of what happens, or, or such an example. Namely, you could prevent ammonia from uh, the doing the umbrella inversion. And it's related to, at least that's kind of the, as a model explaining everything. So the restriction of the representation, so to Frobenius reciprocity. And if you scroll through um, the more, it's, it's kind of roughly came up in the 70s, the more modern, uh, literature and chemistry have lots of those effects where some some version of you restrict representations, you induce representations, you compute characters in one way, you compute characters in the other way. And then there's some experiment and it explains some really crazy sometimes behavior of molecules. And it's, it's, it's really beautiful. It's actually really beautiful. Okay, um, so I wrapped up this representation theory series, which I hope you liked. Um, it was very enjoyable for me, at least. So I hope you enjoyed it as well. I learned a lot. I hope you learned a lot. Anyway, so I wrapped it up in this video by showing you that representation theory is not just beautiful, or at least I tried to show you. Well, we'll see. Uh, representation theory is not just beautiful, but also very applicable. Um, and even the applications are beautiful. This, I, I, I mean, this inversion, and you can kind of detect it on the characters. Is I think that's pretty cool, actually. 
Um, anyway, you should come to your own conclusions. All I wanted to say is uh, thank you for watching. And I had a lot of fun creating these representation theory series. I hope you enjoyed the video and I will hope to see you next time.